on your schedule tomorrow. We're going to put that off to the side. And we're going to have our ears open and our hearts open to the preaching of God's Word. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's welcome Brother Rossi to Longpole College. Hey. Thank you, Pastor. And if you're ready to receive tonight, say amen. amen. It's good to be in God's house, and it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. And that's what David said. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yes. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, tonight to the book of Philippians in chapter number 3. The book of Philippians in chapter 3. We had another great meal this afternoon. And I'll be honest with you, I am so ready to fall asleep. It's not even funny. <laughs> so uh, if I fall asleep while I'm preaching, somebody wake me up. Uh, you know, it's bad when the preacher falls asleep when he's preaching. So uh, Philippians chapter 3, and um, quite a historic day in America. And uh, we need to pray much for our nation, for God's hand upon us. And uh, no president, and no cabinet, and no House of Congress. No elected body is going to solve our problems right. in America right Amen. now. Right. The only answer right. to this country is an old-fashioned revival. Amen. And uh, whether, you, whether you voted for the president or not, whether you like him or not, uh, we now have a new president. And uh, I'm sure some here, that's exciting. Some of you may not have voted for him. We certainly are a divided nation. Therefore, wherever you go, it's about 50-50. People love the new president. They uh, hate the old president or vice versa, whatever. Uh, whatever your preference is here, we're commanded by God right. to pray for all those that are in authority over right. us. Right. And we need to pray for the president, pray for Washington, pray for the hand of God upon that part of the world, that God would give good wisdom and great power to all those who are now taking uh, authority, especially while we're at war. You know, we're still at war. We forget sometimes that uh, we still are uh, in conflict over in Iraq and the Middle East. And I uh, pray for the, our soldiers in harm's way and uh, for God's hand upon them now that they have a new commander-in-chief. Uh, we want to pray for the Lord's hand upon our armed forces. But Philippians chapter 3 tonight. Philippians chapter 3. And I'd like to begin to speak tonight in verse number 13, Philippians chapter number 3. Let's stand up together for the reading of the Word of God. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those which are before. And I'm going to speak out of this very familiar portion of the Bible. We've heard, I'm sure, a sermon from it. Some of you have probably heard a number of sermons as a Christian on this idea of pressing toward the mark. Have you ever heard a sermon on that at some time in your life? And yet I want to speak for a little while out of the same chapter of the Bible by way of reminder and I'm going to speak simply on the subject, it's time to stretch ourselves out. It is time to push ahead as the people of God. Boy, if I ever need this message, I need it tonight. I told Lewis today, I don't know why, but man, I've been fat battling uh, just fatigue all day long. And I, I told you about the medication I was on and all that. They said it'll be probably a year before I'm really 100%. And uh, so who knows what's going to happen here. Uh, if I don't make it through the sermon, I'll tag you on the way down, Brother Zeri, and uh, you can finish it up. The man from outer space will finish the sermon. Say amen to that. But uh, it is great. Uh, we've had a great time this week. Uh, I love coming here. We got to go over to the, uh, what was the name of it today? The Jetty. And I uh, got clam chowder at the Jetty. The boy clam chowder at the Jetty is an event for me. Uh, I ate it over in Santa Maria one time, and it was real thick. 
Uh, I mean, I stayed full for about three days from that stuff, and, uh, and I feel that way again tonight. But uh, I want to begin uh, tonight and speak uh, simply this message and preach for a little while the subject, it is time to stretch ourselves out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word of God. We ask thy blessing upon it. Lord, how we need to hear from heaven. More than anything else, we need to hear from thee. May you have your way is our prayer. May you have your way upon America. May you have mercy upon this nation. We pray that you'll touch the president's heart. We pray you'll uh, give him wisdom and guidance in the days ahead. All those around him, the cabinet members, the Senate, the Congress, the judicial leaders of this nation, the Supreme Court, would you lay your hand upon this nation in these last days? We pray for Mr. Bush and his wife as they uh, probably made their way back to Texas by now. Would you strengthen him, bless him, thank you for the eight years that he's given to our nation. And uh, Lord, uh, bless the time of retirement that he'll be facing in the days ahead. Thank you for all that you are. We thank you that you've been faithful to us individually and collectively as a nation. And we pray that as we turn back to you, that you'll be faithful once again. Thank you for what you'll do tonight. Bless this time together, we ask. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. Our text tonight is a tremendous exhortation in the Bible. If you study it out, you'll find that the Apostle Paul was writing by inspiration to the church which was in, located in a place called Philippi. If you study this chapter and those around it, you'll find that Philippians was written somewhere around A.D. 64 and is one of Paul's prison epistles. He was writing from a jail cell uh, in Rome. He was writing knowing that the end of his life was at hand and coming near. And yet, in spite of writing to them and talking about how bad it was and talking to Timothy and others about how hard he had it, it said, instead, in four chapters of this book of the Bible, he reminds us again that you and I ought to rejoice in the Lord. Listen, if we can rejoice in a jail cell, how many believe we can rejoice in church? Amen. Amen. And, and, and if he can rejoice, in a prison, some of you kids, you can rejoice even though you think your mom and dad are wardens, amen? But I mean, folks, you and I as God's people, uh, we are commanded by God in four chapters of this book of the Bible that we should rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we know the verse where he said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. How many tonight, if you really think about it, you do have something to rejoice over? Amen. Amen. Uh, it's not been uh, a big day of rejoicing for me. It's been a day of, of tiredness for some reason. But folks, in spite of it all, we can still thank God for how good He has been to us. And we can still thank God uh, for our family, for our friends, for those around us. I had a man say, well, preacher, I don't have any friends. Well, thank God for the ones that you don't have that would hurt you. Amen. Uh, it doesn't matter how bad it is. We all have. A, we can all thank God for something. Right. And so rejoice in the Lord. That is God's command for us. Now in chapter 3, Paul begins to answer some people who are Judaizers. They were trying to get people uh, to, to watch after the law of Moses and to keep it in addition to their Christian life. I want you to know tonight that salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. Right. And you cannot add to the gospel in order to make yourself uh, right before God. Right. Our, all of our righteousness is found in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Paul said that he could have been a righteous man according to the law if that were possible. He begins to give his credentials as a Jew. And he said in verse number 7, he began to say all the great things he has done all the way down from chapter 1 through verse or verse 1 through 6 of chapter 3. But then he said in verse 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In other words, everything I've ever accomplished, I count it all as nothing because my goal in life is simply to be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, uh, righteousness cannot be earned. How many of you know that tonight? Amen. Had a man tell me today that he's a pretty good person, and after all, he's only been drunk three times in his whole life, and he doesn't curse very often. He curses 
one time in my presence uh, while uh, we were talking to him for a few moments, but he felt like that would be good enough to get into heaven. I said, sir, no matter how good you are, it's not good enough in the eyes of God. All our righteousness are as filthy rags in the eyes of God, and the only hope we have and the only righteousness we have is through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To be found in Him. That's what Paul said. And then in verse number 10, he said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. He said I want to have an experiential knowledge, a working knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to know about someone. It's another thing to know someone intimately. Years ago, I attended a large conference in 1984, and I remember a friend of mine took me way up by the front. It was a preaching conference in Washington, D.C. A large delegation of preachers from all over America attended that. And then they said uh, on Thursday morning, we had a special guest coming in, uh, President Ronald Reagan. I couldn't wait to see Ronald Reagan. He came and spoke to us, by the way. Uh, He's still one of my heroes. Uh, you might not like that, but that's all right. Uh, I think he was a great man. Amen. Thank you all nine of you. But I mean, I thought he was, uh, I thought he was one of the great uh, statesmen uh, that America had. Maybe one of the last ones in, 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 the, in the prior decades. But anyway, this man of God, uh, Ron, Ronald Reagan, was up there on the platform. He spoke to us from his heart. We all finished. When he finished, uh, we uh, went up by the front as close as we could. And I remember all those secret service men were stretched out with their arms like this. You couldn't get near. And I got right to the front line and somehow I stuck my arm right through two of the Secret Service men. They had their uh, their outfits on with the little earpieces. You could tell they were there for business. But I got my arm through and Mr. Reagan stopped, looked at me and he said, it's alright. And he shook my hand through the ground. Brother, I couldn't believe it. I said, man, praise the Lord. I went there. My hands never felt the same. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I was there having shook, uh, shook the hand of one of my living heroes at the time. I remember walking away to all my friends. I said, don't touch this hand. Get away from me, you bunch of heathens. They were all mad at me and jealous. And you know what I could say after that? Well, I know Robert Reagan. I know him well. I know Mr. Reagan real well. Of course not. I might have reached over and touched him. I might have reached over and shook his hand. But certainly I can't say that I knew Mr. Ronald Reagan. I couldn't say that and be honest about it. I simply heard him speak. I saw, I heard him on the television like you did. I got uh, as close as I am to Brother Ziri. Stuck my hand through. He stuck his hand out and shook mine. And that was the end of the story. I can say that I know Christ, but I want to know him better. Do I have any name? I know him. I've read about him. I've read of him. I've seen him at work in people's lives. And yet Paul said, I want to know him in the way that I know someone intimately as a dear friend. And he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now in verse 11, look at it with me. Let's study the Bible tonight. Is that okay with you? Amen. How about if we read the Bible tonight? Chapter 3, verse 11. Let's look at it together. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Then he said in verse 12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. The word attain is an interesting word in your Bible. It means to arrive or to gain something fully. In other words, when you attain something, it means you've got all that you want to grasp of it. And he said, I haven't attained. And so this is a very important word. He said, I have not attained. In other words, in verse 12, he said, I'm not already attained. I haven't gotten to the end of perfection in the Christian life. He said, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am what? Apprehended of Christ Jesus. The word apprehended in the Bible. It means to seize. It means to lay hold on something. It's a picture of being arrested. It's a, it's a picture of being incarcerated and put in, put in chains and put in, uh, in manacles and thrown into prison. Paul said, I haven't attained the Christian life. I haven't got to the place where I can say, well, I'm old now. I'm in jail, boys. I'm going to turn my toes up soon. I'm going to die real soon. And so therefore, no need me pressing on. He said, I haven't got a hold of everything. But I have been apprehended, grabbed from behind. He said, I want to get a hold of it the same way in which I have been gotten a hold of. 
I remember as kids growing up, we would throw snowballs and cars going by up in the city of Baltimore. I know that's wrong. I know it's a sin. Somebody say none to that. Yeah, and we throw throw snowballs. You don't have that problem here. Maybe you threw rocks at them. I don't know. We would throw snowballs and stuff. And one day I packed a snowball a little bit too hard. And a guy came driving up the road. I think it was about a 69 uh, Chevy Nova. Uh, 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 not a Nova. It was a beautiful Super Sport. Chevy Super Sport Malibu driving up the road. I threw my snowball and instead of a nice little breaking snowball, it went thud and hit the side of his car and put a dent right in the side of his car. I realized what I'd done. I started to run. This young man slammed on the brakes. These were the good old days. Back when you used to be able to do what needs to be done to a little brat who hit your car with a snowball. Can't do that anymore. You're going to end up in jail for 20 years. But back then, uh, they could do what was necessary to avert uh, kids from throwing snowballs in their car. So he took off and ran after me. I had those big old goo washes on. Remember the guy that had the little buckles around them? Uh, snow boots over my shoes. And I started running away. My, me and my friends. Man, he got out of the car. He was about a 25, 30 year old guy. Athletic. He said, you little brat. And some other things. And he started chasing me uh, across the logs. I went over a fence. That guy just, I think, uh, got over the fence without even touching it. And I felt something grab me from behind. I slipped and fell. And the next thing I know, a man had a hold of me by the collar and he was rubbing my face into the snow. You little brat, I can't believe what you did and held my face up and said, I'm sorry, not enough. Man, he put my, my little head down in the snow, rubbed me down in the snow, took me home. I had to pay for the guy's car. My dad paid and I had to pay him back. You know why? I got apprehended. I got caught from behind. And Paul said this, I've been apprehended. I've been caught from behind by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, God God has laid hold of my life. Uh, he's got something on me that he's not letting go of. Therefore, I want to ca capture him and grasp him in the same way that God has gotten a hold of me. He said this in verse 13, and here's our text. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have what? He said, I haven't got it. I haven't gotten a hold of everything that God has for me. Amen. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth, which those are before, I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I have not arrived. I haven't gotten a hold of everything God has for me. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to forget my whole life. He said, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. You know what happens to you and I if we spend too much time in the past? We can end up becoming apathetic because we've done so many great things and how wonderful we are. If we're not careful, our entire life will be lived in the past tense. I did this. I saw this. I was involved in that. And sometimes we think people ought to be patting us on the back because of the incredible job that we did, at least in our own minds. And we realize the older we get, the better we were. Remember that? I mean, I look back on how we were in life, and boy, we used to do this, and boy, we used to do that, and oh, look at these kids of ours, and they're growing up, and they're slobs. Hey, hey uh, you, you realize when you were 21 and 22, you might not have had as clean a house as you thought you did. Amen to that. And I mean, folks, uh, we always remember it differently than what it was. And Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. In other words, I'm putting my past behind me Reaching forth toward that which is before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now tonight this word reaching, it means to extend oneself uh, with great energy towards something. It's one thing to say, hey, Brother Zeri, or say, hey, Pastor. It's a whole nother for me to say, hey, preacher, and to reach as far out as I can in order uh, to grasp his hand. Some of you perhaps rescued somebody out of the water. I remember one of our kids we saw him in a swimming pool over by the side of the pool. Uh, my wife and I were in a campground, and I saw that he disappeared. We ran over to the pool, and he was in the bottom of the pool. He was a little five-year-old boy. Uh, we could see his hair stretched out. 
and see his little face looking up toward the top. It was kind of cold out. It wasn't a nice day. And I remember getting as far as I could, reaching way down into that pool and grabbing his little arm and pulling him up, pulling him out of the pool. Listen, if it had taken more, I'd have gone in after him. Amen? I'd have just dove right in. But I reached down as far as I could, grabbed his little arm, grabbed him by the hand, pulled him out, and then we got him out. He was fine, uh, just full of water and scared to death a little bit. Uh, I mean, folks, to know I was going to reach as far as it took to pull that little get out of, out of the pool. You know why that is? Uh, you and I, as God's people, we ought to be reaching out towards God and stretching ourselves toward God as far as we can that we might apprehend the very things of God in our life. Paul said, I haven't arrived. I haven't attained. I'm not perfect. Now tonight, how do you have to admit you're not perfect either? Amen. 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 Uh, none of us are perfect. Sir, I, I know how tough it is. You're going to have to admit to your wife one of these days, I'm not perfect. Wives, you're telling all the time it's not perfect anyway, so that's not a problem. And ladies, you're not perfect either. Somebody say amen to this. None of us are flawless. None of us are always right. Amen. You say, well, preacher, yeah, you're right. I'm only uh, I'm right 99% of the time, and that's about it. I mean, none of us are always correct. And yet he said, uh, I'm not perfect. He said, I haven't arrived. I haven't attained. But this one thing I do. I'm going to reach, and I'm going to press, and I'm going to get a hold of everything that God has for my life. And here's a man knowing that his time is up. He's about to die. He said, I'm going to press. That word press is a strengthened form of the word reach. In other words, it's now no longer reaching. I mean, he is pushing himself beyond the absolute limit. I've been to the 6th Battalion Ranger Base in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and I remember going down there as some young men came in from night maneuvers. They've been, they were in their phase three uh, of their training. They'd already been to Rock Base up in Nalonica, Georgia. They'd already been to Jump School over in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And now these young men were in phase three. They were in swap phase uh, down uh, near Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I remember going in with the colonel and some other men and some were friends of mine uh, that were, uh, they were uh, trainers and sergeants there on, on the team of trainers of the 6th Battalion. We saw these young men. They were coming in from maneuvers and they've been under sleep deprivation for about three weeks every day they took a little bit less sleep each day a little bit less each day uh, they get less sleep these fellows were google-eyed they had little black glasses on they had to keep on all the time uh, they weren't for sight it was to protect their eyes from the elements and these young men had loud music playing uh, around them to distract them loud blasting rock music and they were all cleaning and assembling uh, uh, disassembling their weapons, cleaning their weapons out, making sure the weapons were clean, and they had to put them back together in a certain amount of time. Uh, I sort of, uh, I was excited to see them. Hey guys, they said, please don't bother them. They are way out on the limit. They are stretched all the way out as far as human beings can go. And one of the trainers told, told me they take these boys to the edge and to the brink of sanity to make sure they can handle it under real uh, live uh, uh, military and wartime conditions. They're all the way out. They are stretched all the way out. So you know that seals go up uh, in the San Francisco Bay area and they have to swim great distance that most people would be hypothermic. Uh, most people would die. Most people would fall out. But they have to make that swim uh, in order to pass uh, some of their final testing because they want men that they know can stretch all the way out as far as human beings can go in order to be under extreme conditions uh, when they'll go out uh, into a real life uh, wartime scenario. Folks, tonight, you and I, as God's people, we're in a battle. We are in war. Do I have an amen? amen? We are living under warfare that's far more intense than what's going on in Afghanistan, far more intense than what's going on in Iraq. They may not be real bullets. They may not be uh, missiles. We may not have these, uh, these devices that are uh, exploding around us, but they're real life satanic warfare and missiles that are trying and destroy our life. And God wants us to reach out and stretch ourselves even sometimes to the place where we think we can't make it. How many ever been there as a Christian? How many ever been there as a child of God and you said, Lord, I'm not sure that I can go much further than this. 
God, I'm not sure that I can endure this trial that I'm under much longer. And yet Paul reminds us that he wants us to run this race, race with great patience. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, If a man also strive for the masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. He talks about you and I living in this race and living uh, in this warfare and living under this battle and yet all the time stretching ourselves further than we ever have before. Of course, you know that one of the most common metaphors in the New Testament is the picture of a runner in a race where he was running with a goal of finishing. I'm not a marathon runner, obviously. Uh, a couple of good looks at me and you can tell that, amen. Uh, and I'm not in great shape physically right now, especially. But understand, if you're going to stay in good shape physically and you're going to be a marathon runner, you must follow at least two or three very, very important rules of marathon running. What is the goal? First ultimate goal of a marathon runner is to do what? It's first what? It's to finish. That is his first and foremost goal. That doesn't sound very exciting to me. I like to come in first place. I like things that go from zero to 60 in three or four seconds. I like very fast things. Amen? And I've had fast cars and fast motorcycles and fast whatever. I like it when you uh, let the clutch out, boom, and you're down the straightaway and you're done in about eight or nine seconds. Some people like things that they love. They, it's a long run, 26.3 miles, and they train and they get the themselves ready. And that's really what Paul is referring to here. He's not talking about a short burst. He's not talking about a, a burst of excitement or whatever. He is talking about getting this thing and staying with it and running it all the way to the end. In order to do that, by the way, how many want to finish? Amen. How many really want to finish this race? Amen. He wants us to, finish, to run number one patiently. He said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2, that you and I are to run uh, with patience the race that is set before us. He wants you and I as God's people to realize there's going to be some trial. There's going to be testing. There will be heartache along the way. And yet all the while, He wants us to stay in the race. How many ever wanted to quit? I don't want to say, man, I'm just tired of this. This race is too long. It's too tedious. It's too strenuous for me. Yet he said we need to race, run patiently. We need to run properly. He said we must run uh, lawfully uh, in, in 2 Timothy 2.5. We've got to stay with this within the boundary lines of the Word of God. This is not a free-for-all. This is not, uh, you know, this is not one of these games where they uh, throw the ball in the middle, bull in the ring of the football team. This is where we are really uh, supposed to be running orderly. There is a boundary line. There is a course that God set out. That's why Paul said that his goal was to finish his course. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. He said, I have finished my course. And he said, I've got a place that God has caused me to run in, and you and I ought to run this race patiently. Amen. Amen. So he wants us to run patiently. He wants us to run properly. He wants us to run purposely. He wants us to run this race where you and I are pressing for the mark, toward the mark, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now tonight this word high calling is an interesting word in your Bible. You think about it as being heaven, and of course it is, but there's even something greater than that that a Greek man knew exactly what God was speaking to when he heard these words penned by the Apostle Paul. A man running in the marathon race, especially in the Greek and the Olympic test style games, they would run, and there was a man who was literally located on a high tower that he would watch the entire race. He was the official. He was the referee. And that man would watch the whole race to make sure that all the runners stayed within the boundaries. They stayed within the course. He was sort of like an air traffic controller. He made sure everything was done the right way and all those little blips on the screen don't collide and all that and coming at the right time. He was watching over the entire race. And this man way up on this, uh, this tower, it was called a judgment seat. It was called the Bema. And a man was literally on top of the Bema seat where he would look down and he was the judge over the entire race. 
You know, the Bible says we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Have you ever heard that verse of Scripture? Amen. That word is literally translated uh, that we must all appear at the Bema seat of Christ. It is the same word that God translates in the English language for judgment. This man would sit on top of that tower. He would watch the race down below. And when a man won the race, there was only one call to the very top. And when he, got, when he won the race, they would call his name and cause him to come all the way to the top of the tower and receive the prize. You know what that was called? It was called the high calling. The man who won the race was the man who got the high calling. It'd be one thing to say, hey guys, good to see you all. Good to see you there, Justin. Good to see you, uh, Brother Zeering. Good to see you, Gary. That's one thing. It'd be another thing for me to say, Mr. Payne, we want you to come to the high calling. That meant we wanted you to come to the very top. And we would award Mr. Payne the highest prize that we had because he won the race. We were glad for the others who finished, but there was only one who got the prize. And that prize was given... Uh, through that high calling uh, at, at the race. You know what Paul said? I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize, listen, of the high calling of God. He said there's going to be a day when we stand before the Lord. And I want to hear the, that high calling. Do you know what else would happen when a man was got called up to that, to that seat and called up to win the race? If he came across the finish line first, they would call him to the top at the Bema seat, and you know what the judge would say to that man? Simple words, but they were very important. He would call his name and he would use these words. Are you ready? Come up hither. Come up hither. And that man would come to the top. How many of you know the Bible? You ever heard that before? That's the exact phrase he would use in Greek. He would say, come up hither. The man would come to the top. They would call his name. And then when he got up before the judge, he would bow his head in homage and, and respect for the judge at the Bema seat. And the, and the judge would place a laurel wreath upon his head. And guess what he would say to that man? Well done. Those are the words he would use. Well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what happened at that, at that Bema seat? A man was awarded uh, and given a reward for the fact that he had finished the race, that he had raced patiently, that he had run, that he had raced properly, and he had finished with a great purpose. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm going to run this race. Amen. And it's worth stretching out. Because those who love God and those who finish properly, we're going to be called up to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter number 4, the Bible uh, says he heard a, a voice of a trumpet, as it were, talking with me, which said, Come up hither. I don't know about you, but I still believe in the rapture of the church. Amen. I still believe in a free tribulation rapture of the church. I don't care how many people you listen to. I don't care how many Bible studies you attend. I don't care what preacher you listen to on the TV set with a big chart and everything else. If he's telling you that there's no such thing as a rapture of the church before the tribulation, he does not know the Bible. Right. You know, I'm an amen. Yeah. Uh, Christ is coming back. The Bible said that the Lord Himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He, he said, uh, he'll, he'll, with a trumpet, with the voice of the archangel, Revelation 4, it said, I heard as it were the voice of a great trumpet talking to me, saying, Come up hither. God said we'll all be changed in a moment at the last trump in the twinkling of an eye. You study the Bible, there's a trumpet that's going to sound, and when it does, those who are here are going to disappear. He said, that's fantastic. That cannot be. Well, let me ask you this. How can it be that God, God would send His only begotten Son to die on the cross for you? How can it be that Christ could go into the ground for three days and yet come up and, and rise from the dead? How can it be that a virgin Mary could conceive? Hey, if God can do that, He said, with God, all things are possible. Amen. And I would challenge you to show me one time after Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 1, you show me the true church on earth. 
And I'll tell you tonight, uh, I'll eat one of my socks. You can't do it. You can't show me the true church. You'll find an apostate church. You'll find the beast. You'll find uh, you'll find uh, the uh, the ungodly, uh, the Babylon church. But you'll not find true churches down. They're always looking up from heaven. Christ is coming back, and when He comes back, we're going to hear those words at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Rewards are going to be given out. He said, well, preacher, I, I just want to get in. That's all I care about. If I'm the last one in, that'll be fine. You won't feel that way in heaven. Right. There's going to be a day when there's some will suffer loss, and some will suffer, and some will have reward, and some will suffer shame. And there's going to be a day in heaven where God is going to dispense rewards based upon uh, what we have done for Jesus Christ. Have you ever sat through a ceremony and heard somebody else get accoladed and awarded and thought, boy, I sure wish I would have done that. Have you ever sat through If you have any spirit of competition in your heart, all of us want to excel. Don't we, man? Nobody likes to say, well, what's your goal? I just want to lose everything this year. If I can just lose every game, then I can be like the Detroit Lions and, and I go on and of the season. Nobody ever sets out and says, boys, we're going to set a record. We're not going to win one game this year. Everybody wants to be a winner. Right. Paul said, when I stand before God, I want to know that I have run this race with patience. I want to know that I've run this race properly. I want to know that I have given all that I have for God. He said, therefore, I want to stretch myself out and give more of my life than I ever have before our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. Folks, I believe He's not only coming, but I believe He's coming very soon. Yeah. Amen. I think I told you a few years ago we went out and looked at dogs. And my younger daughter and my wife, we were looking at dogs and determining what kind of a dog we were going to get. I took them to the dog store and said, let's go look at pets. This would be great. We went out together and, man, I was standing there. They had a beautiful Labrador in there in one cage and a real nice-looking Rottweiler and a nice-looking uh, German Shepherd and a Pit Bull. I said, what about these girls? And I turned and they were gone. And my wife and daughter were around the corner. I went around there and they were looking at a Yorkie. Amen? I mean, I'm talking about one of those little dogs that has bows in its, in its, uh, in its little ears and all that. And I could see me now pulling up Evangelist Lou Rossi, my little Yorkie, and sticking his head at that thing in the channel. Amen. So I said, this is not going to work. I said, oh, no, I don't like those. And then my daughter said, oh, 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 I love this one, Daddy. It's even better. And I said, oh, great. Uh, I've escaped the Yorkie. And I looked, and even worse, it was a chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, one of these teacup chihuahuas. They got the little dog out. We sat down in the little parent uh, area where you, uh, they call it, I think, the, the, the greeting center. And we sat down. We had to wash our hands. They put antibacterial uh, lotion on our hands. I said, well, we haven't touched the dog yet. They said, oh, no, this is to keep you from infecting the dog. I believe Americans have gone crazy saying any of this. Uh, I mean, I remember dogs. They were out in front of Walmart, free to go to home, cage. And they said, give me $5. I'll give you this one. Now, that was a dog. But I remember sitting down and uh, they, they made us they clean our hands all first. And the little dog was let loose and started jumping all around. And oh, oh, he's so cute. Oh, I said, look, he's attacking me. He's biting my foot. Yeah, I can see he's already he's vicious. Amen. This would be a real killer. The girl came over and I said, all right, this is the one you like. He said, uh, I said, ma'am, how much is the dog? She said, well, sir, he's already got his shots. He's already been wormed. I said, worm, if this dog had a worm, this dog wouldn't exist. Amen? I mean, if you took a worm out of this dog, it would be nothing left. The dog was no bigger than a worm. And, I, and she said, this dog's been wormed. It's had its shots. She said, it's already been chipped. I said, chipped? What are you talking about? She said, he's already got his global implant. He's already been chipped. He's got his RFID device already inserted underneath his skin. And I said, what does that mean? It means wherever he goes, no matter where, if you lose him, we'll find him well, with GPS. If he runs away, we'll find him. If somebody steals him, we'll find him. I wanted to say, well, what happens if I step on him? He's under my shoe. Uh, they say, we found him. He's under your foot. Whoops. <laughs> Poor little thing. Uh, who wants to buy a doll that you can smash in the middle of the night accidentally? Say amen to that. And she said, uh, here it is. And she said, now, I said, how much is this fine animal? She said, sir, they're on sale. This dog is only eleven hundred dollars. Praise the Lord, I'll take four of them. 
I've been singing it out, waiting. Pastor, uh, Pastor Collins, dear Pastor Collins, please help our ministry. We're trying to buy our daughter an eleven hundred dollar dog. I don't think that would sound real good, but I think you know that. I said we'll come back some other time. God bless you. And uh, finally, I had a way out. You know what I found out, folks? They're not just chipping dogs. Somebody gave us one later, by the way, and uh, that was the one that ended up with three legs. But uh, that's a long story. But uh, you know, they're not just chipping dogs now. They're chipping people. There are people right now who are uh, being uh, literally getting chipped and, in, and getting implants placed under the skin of their right hand. Some people have already gotten an implant underneath the skin of their forehead. And these are the two best areas for an RFID device. They say the battery life is much longer if they put it right here or right here. A few months ago in Texas, a full colonel with the CIA pulled me aside and said, Preacher, I've already got mine. It's in my new ID card. And he said, as soon as they're ready, they'll take this out of my ID card and they will inject it and implant it underneath of my skin. I'm saying to you tonight that we are that close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, there'll be a day in Revelation chapter 13 where the Bible says that no man shall be able to buy or sell or get gain except he receive a mark in his right hand or in his forehead. That's exactly how specific the Bible is. God didn't say on it. God said in it. Say amen to that. And so there will be a day when people will receive implants to where that will be their national ID badge and that will be their way of buying and trading and selling. And no man will be able to buy or sell or get gain except you receive that mark. Why did I say all that? Because Paul knew he was toward the end of his life. And you know what he said? I'm not going to lay over. I'm not going to roll over. I'm not just going to check into the survival mode. I'm not going to just settle for the obscurity of security. Somebody say amen to that. I'm going to give my life to do more than I ever have for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. And here's my question before we close tonight. Are you stretching yourself out to say yes sir every night? I stretch out on that uh, on that couch, and I get that uh, and I get that remote control and a bag of chips, and I'm stretched. Amen. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you stretching yourself for the cause of Christ? When the pastor says we're having a soul winning day, do you attend that soul winning day? He said, "Yes, I do. I come to soul winning breakfast. I eat a little breakfast. I make half a visit, and I go to Walmart, and then I go home." No, I mean, do you give of yourself and stretch yourself that other people might get saved? Are you stretching yourself to seek the face of God? Are you stretching yourself out to serve and be a, a, a blessing and supply in the house of God? I've had people say, Preacher, we can't give now, ladies. You know how it is out there. No, friends, I believe we ought to give more than we ever have proportionally. Maybe not as much monetarily, but proportionally, we ought to increase our giving. That way, God has promised that He'll meet every one of our needs. Say amen. Yes. Yes. Tonight, God wants us all to learn what it means to very much so press toward the mark and stretch ourselves out. Why is that? Because one day we're all going to stand before God. One day all of us are going to hear those words come up hither. One day perhaps very soon we're going to face that judgment seat of Christ. I have a, in my notes the true story and I think his name is Kang Su Chung. I, I might have mispronounced his name because they're not with me. In 1938, this young man, he was, a, he was a South Korean. He ran in the Olympic Games in Berlin, Germany. This young man who, uh, who, was, who became the world record holder in the world marathon crossed the finish line and set two world records during those Olympic Games. At the ceremony, at the end of the Games, when they gave out the medals, as they put a medal around his neck, he and his young uh, friend, who was also his partner and runner, they bowed their heads in protest because they were not receiving a medal for South Korea. Instead, the Japanese had their medal put around their necks because Japan, uh, or Korea, had been invaded by Japan and thereby annexed South Korea as a part of Japan. They protested. They were not standing for Japan. They loved their native country of South Korea, as any of us would for America. And because of that, instead of joy and, and, and exhilaration of winning the, those games and winning the race, these young men were saddened and hung their heads in protest. But in the 80s, 
during the Seoul Korea Olympic Games, that same man, now 76 years old, was uh, privileged to take the Olympic torch. He came running into the stadium, and they say that he was carrying in one hand the, the Korean flag and, in, and the, a torch in the other. He came running in to the, to the stadium at the opening ceremonies when they brought the torch in to light it, and he was so full of joy he couldn't hold it in. He came and began leaping and rejoicing and shouting all the way around the track because he has now come all the way back full circle and allowed to come in under the, under the banner of his native country. They say he was so elated. I have pictures of this at home. And you know what, folks? Tonight, one day, you and I are going to stand before God. And one day when we enter into the presence of God, if we'll serve Him with joy, and we'll run with joy that race that is set before us with patience and joy and with expectancy, perhaps one day, as the people of God, you and I will hear those wonderful words, Well done! good and faithful servant, and thou into the joy of thy Lord. I have a question for us all tonight. Are we stretching out? Or are we just sort of backing up and giving in? Pastor's got a big program here. Rise up and build. It's a big challenge. It's a very large challenge for this church. I talked to them about the price of what they think it'll cost. It's going to be a lot of money for a church this size. It's a big project to say uh, we're actually thinking about tearing down buildings and rebuilding new ones. Yet we have a God who's well able to do anything. To have Amen. Amen. As long as we know that that's in His will for our life. But it'll take some stretching. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take faith. It's going to take trust in God and staying together as the people of God. And the question is tonight, are we going to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling that you and I as His people I hear those wonderful words, come up hither, well done, good and faithful servant, and eventually be crowned with that crown of faithfulness for serving and living for our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like for us to bow our heads, please, and our hearts together for prayer.